Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today we talk with veteran trader, a true market wizard, Jason Shapiro. And Corey and I will talk about the current bear market. Yes, you heard me right. And remember, if you have a question or want to tell us what's on your mind, as always, email us at feedback at investorhour.com. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. You heard me right, folks. I said bear market. It's Dan doing that bear market thing again. What I'm specifically referring to uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the way I see it, and then I'll tell you some stuff I saw on Twitter by the Luthold Group, which is a pretty well-known research firm. They do really good historical research. And for me personally, what I see is the regular S&P 500 is up, you know, making new highs. Great. The Dow was making new highs as of, I think, October, November. Okay, great. But the equal weight S&P is not doing nearly as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can do the same sort of exercise with the NASDAQ 100 and equal weight, though they're both making new highs. However, the thing that, that concerns me is the NASDAQ composite, not making new highs. The Russell 2000, not making new highs. And I told you the Luthold Group has put out a tweet, and they're talking about the fact that the this doesn't, be, the, the, the market is not behaving um, like the early stages of any past bull market that they've studied, right? The initial conditions preceding, you know, the bull run of late last year and now into this year um, were different. And the small cap rally is not nearly as big as what you'd expect at the beginning of a typical bull run. So, you know, I, they say we're still in a bear market and I have to agree with that. And, you know, it looks like we're back to 2023. The Mag 7 is in charge, the Magnificent 7, right? Apple and Microsoft, Amazon, um, Alphabet, Tesla, NVIDIA, Meta Platforms. They're pulling up the big indexes where the equal weight indexes are weaker because, you know, most stocks are weak. Most stocks aren't making these new highs. So that's where we are. Yeah, it's interesting you bring this up because... Only recently has the S and P 500 started making new highs, and it's up 20 percent from uh, the lows uh, last October. So, even by like the more conservative bull market definitions, that one qualifies, right? But I agree with you. Small caps, like they lead the way out. I mean, every other when it turns into a, from a bear market to a bull market, like typically lead the way out, and you're starting to see that on the up days. I would say when, when I'm looking like uh, each day, like if there's an up day, small caps are are right. up more, but they're still um, way below their highs. And the equal weight, like you said, is is just going has been sideways for a long, you know, going back to start of 2022, probably. I know yeah. we got this sort of equal weight pop in December. Yeah, right. I thought, oh, okay. It's over, and this is a broad rally now, and so maybe this is the start of something serious, and it's going to be a new bull market. But it it's fizzled here in January, so not there yet. Definitely not there yet. Yeah, it's the the mag six it's, now too, without Tesla, which has taken a a bath the last uh, week or so with that earnings report where they said EVs to follow up on our EV discussion. Uh, that EV uh, sales they do not expect to forgot the exact words but basically be lower than way lower than last year so tesla's going the opposite direction of the others but um yeah you just wonder how much longer does do do those uh magnificent six now i will call them how much longer do they have to go to run higher i i, I don't know i mean so far so good in 2024 for them but not so much others but nothing you know nothing goes up forever right. though right it's just sort of uh I mean, when does it end? They're great businesses, but that's the point. See, everybody knows that. That's the problem with this argument. It's it's exactly like the nifty fifty argument. 
You can just buy these. They're no-brainers. They'll grow forever. They're the greatest businesses in the world. They gush free cash flow. They pay dividends. Their financial condition is superior, blah, blah, blah. They're the biggest companies in the world. Money pours into them constantly. I mean, there's a million arguments why they just have to keep being the best investments in the stock market. Well, you know, at some point, too many people think that, and then, you know, it's not true anymore. And it's, you'd think we'd be past the point of everyone thinking that and, and it being too much. But so far, <laughs> we have, we're not there yet. Right. And if you're looking for <laughs> why this matters to a portfolio, like, you know, the prices will matter and your timeline will matter. And I'm thinking about, we talked with Matt last week about this quant portfolio that we've developed. There are, I don't think I'm giving too much away by saying there are none of the magnificent stocks in, in <laughs> that recommendation right now. And it's because they're too expensive, like relative to all the metrics that, you know, all our editors and analysts put together on how to value a business. And so if you're doing this for the long term, it's now is a not the time to be chasing those i would say um that are already no up, definitely not you know what meta's up 150 percent or whatever and um like yeah or 200 yeah, 200 maybe yeah. now so i mean it's it, like that's yeah. it's not going to go up another 200 percent. i'm i'm pretty confident in that right <laughs> in the in the next year yeah. and a half so like it's, yeah yeah. Or if it does, how crazy is that, right? It's just, yeah, right. I mean, if it does, that's even worse, yeah. right? It's farther to fall. But I got my trusty Bloomberg. So the Magnificent Six, actually, Berkshire Hathaway is seventh, and Eli Lilly is, I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six. Seventh is Berkshire Hathaway. Eighth is Eli Lilly. Tesla's ninth in market cap. And the trillion dollar market caps are just the top six. Berkshire Hathaway is 800. Eli Lilly's almost 600. Tesla's 580 billion. Um, so, yeah, magnificent six. Maybe that's the beginning of the end, huh? That's well, the beginning. I, yeah, of what I wanted to say <laughs> to at that point was like the risk reward here um, is not skewed in in the favor. I, I don't think of the reward. I think it's I think it would be more risk at this point. If you're trying to put these into a portfolio, I mean, sure, if you want to own some of them, fine, but like, don't be, you know, betting on Meta to go to double yeah. from here, like anytime soon. Right. It's not. We're. I'm not saying they're not great businesses. I'm not saying you should sell them all if you own them. I'm just saying that you you should own other things. Probably, you know, don't have all your money in these seven now six. Well, let's just call it six. These six stocks. Um, because that's just not how life works. It's really not that easy. It's that easy if you'd have done it 20 years ago. You know, if you'd have done it, you know, years ago and they were like, I remember we recommended Apple in in extreme value in a newsletter called Extreme yeah. Value. And it did really well. You know, that was like 2013 or so. It it was you know, and we looked at it and thought, well, you know, it's still Apple and iPhone, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it turned out great, but I don't think we're not there. <laughs> it's 2024. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're saying we're still in a bear market though. That's, you know, that's a, that's another discussion. Yeah. Right. So that's the other thing. So, you know, what happens in bull markets near the top? Well, you know, the leadership gets narrower and people start saying these are, you know, the no brainers and everybody knows it. Everybody agrees, you know, um, our guest today has some interesting views on what happens when everybody agrees in either direction. Um, curious to let folks hear about that. So you're right. That is the point. This magnificent seven thing is just kind of a, it's kind of a classic symptom really of, you know, near the end of, of a bull run. And in this case, kind of the, what I believe may be the end of a massive, like almost year long really more than year long, right? Um, rally, you know, after the 2022 bear market, you know, part of the market's like making new highs and then a lot of it is not. So this is, um, this is interesting. And I have to say, it doesn't surprise me. And I've talked about the example of the 1966 to 1982 sideways market. And we got a little blip up in the middle, a little new high in the middle and years and years, you know, it was like right in the middle. So it was years since a new high and then years until another one. 
So anything can happen, basically, is the real lesson there. Statistically, it's one data point. It doesn't mean anything. Statistically, we've only had a few sideways markets in the past century. Maybe it doesn't mean so much. I don't know. But I think that's where we are. I think, I think my same concern is still in play. The market is exorbitantly overvalued. It's got these symptoms like MAG7 leadership. And history suggests maybe we're going to get a steeper than 2022 bear decline and maybe a decade plus sideways market. And I think this this may be this this may be the uh, some signs here that that we're in that hmm. tough. I don't want it to be true. I don't want any of it to be true. Yeah. But you know we don't get to fantasize about what we want the market to do, right? So we have to prepare and and guide our readers and listeners uh, the best we can. Yeah, I I mean we can fantasize if, about it if we want, but that <laughs> won't won't do any good. <laughs> I tell you what, I mean, I'm I'm a bit more bullish right now overall, just because of the the trends that have been in play. You know, from a valuation standpoint, I totally agree with you. Um, yeah, and no but argument. Right. The technical momentum, all that stuff, is bullish right now. But I'm also concerned about still what's a, you know what's ahead. Like thinking about the risks ahead, um, I'm thinking more and more that interest rates are going to go higher next than than lower. Like the way. Um, Makes we just sense, got this. Right? We just got this GDP number last week that uh, beat the uh, mainstream economists' expectations by uh, about a percent. It was like three point three percent for the fourth quarter in twenty twenty three. They were expecting two uh, percent. Which, by the way, I, about economists, I, I've I need to mention this because I've written it a couple times in the digest lately. Last month, the UK economists like totally missed on the UK inflation report, which was way higher than, than they thought because of alcohol and tobacco prices and taxes. They've, li- they've raised the taxes there on both of those things and the prices have gone higher too. And so anyway, the economists missed because of, I, I've been saying, because they don't drink it, drink enough, um, like regular old people. <laughs> yeah. um, so, that was a great line. I yeah. saw that. Well, it's yeah. probably not that great, but I keep saying it. So I wanted to say it here. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we got the economy that might be heating back up, if anything, on just even the expectation of rate cuts and what that's like. Housing prices are 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 not cratering, and we got oil going back up now. Um, you know, those are uh, overall that's like good things for the economy, but it may that that may be a surprise that's out there. Um, you know, if the Fed's like, oh, wait a second, we're yeah, we're not going to cut. We're we might have to raise rates a little bit. Um, that would hurt right. prices. A bit, that's I would think, but that's yeah. just me in my mind considering a risk that could be out there right now. Yeah, there was a headline on um, the Daily Shot, which is a bunch of global macro charts every day, which is a neat service if you're into that. A lot of people aren't, but it says the headline um, recently was easier financial conditions may delay the Fed's rate cuts, right? So a stronger economy would ha- tend to have um, the same effect, right? right? You're, you're right. Yeah, so. Just something to consider. You don't need yeah, to that's make, not you're, like, not exactly. really in the prices, I don't think at this point. Like in the, it's definitely not in the narrative we're, we're not, of the market right now. Yeah, we're not making a prediction. We're just saying it makes sense stronger economy, easier financial conditions. You don't cut rates. You don't need to make anything easier for anybody. So yeah, it all, it, it actually, it's all of a piece with the economy being stronger, the market being strong, you know, you, you things should make sense. <laughs> we, we're, we're just saying that if things made sense, we, we would not see cuts <laughs> we're not saying they're not going to cut <laughs> that's a whole different proposition yeah. Uh, yeah. you never know what these guys are going to do um or you know what it's based on really yeah so we shall see it's an interesting moment i think it's it's an interesting and appears to be like a pivotal similar to january 2022 kind of a moment um with the major difference of actually having interest rates we have rates we didn't have them before we had zero before now we have you know five plus percent so we'll see how 2024 works out if history is any 
has any meaning at all, um, of course, actually, really, if history has any meaning at all, two thirds of years and two thirds of the time, the market goes up, right? So that would be normal. But under these circumstances, I think it would also be normal for stocks and even bonds actually to take a breather and maybe for the hikes of the last, um, call it two years here almost, to start to have their effect, more of an effect, you know, to to have some more credit problems. I'm more curious to see how 2024 works out than I, in the past. I've just been like, ah, let it happen. I don't know. I don't care. But I'm really, really curious because I have these views about things. And this moment appears to be, you know, one particular way. We shall see. Time will tell, will it not? It will. Yeah. I think part of the reason the small caps are, have been lagging, small cap stocks have been lagging is because of that credit risk concern with a lot of these smaller companies, yeah. which hasn't, Absolutely. I mean, there's been a lot of bankruptcies, delinquencies, but there hasn't been that like that full blown, you know, crisis, at least outwardly in the, you know, in people's minds. And so I think there's some, still some room for that to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so you're seeing that. I think yeah. that's part of the reason for the, the, the small caps. I mean, that's confounded a lot of people. And it's cyclically normal, right? Right. right. It's just, yeah, cyclically yep. normal and some folks are are saying that you know <laughs> this is it this is the year when the when the when the credit um cycle kicks into gear we'll see it shouldn't i don't think surprise anyone all right um let's go ahead and take a completely different view um instead of talking about a lot of macro stuff um we'll talk to an honest to goodness trader who i believe is our fifth market wizard, not including market wizards author Jack Schwager. Um, his name is Jason Shapiro. He is um, a trader extraordinaire. So let's talk with him. Let's talk with Jason Shapiro. Let's do it right now. NVIDIA may be America's top performing stock after more than doubling this year alone. But if you're holding NVIDIA or thinking of buying it to get a stake in the $7 trillion AI market, you're going to want to see Mark Chaikin's new AI prediction first. Mark is a regular on many major news outlets from Fox Business to CNBC, and he built the stock indicator Wall Street uses to find winning stocks. His award-winning system flashed by on Tesla before it climbed 335%, Moderna before it climbed 300%, and Riot Blockchain before it climbed 10,090%. It also found NVIDIA at the start of 2023 before its massive bull run. But right now, Mark is stepping forward to warn people to stay away from NVIDIA. My system has indicated that NVIDIA is no longer the best stock to buy to profit from AI, Mark says. In fact, it just flashed by on a totally different AI stock. And today... He'd like to hand you the name and ticker symbol of his number one AI stock to buy right now. For a limited time, you can get this information for free at www.aifrenzyreport.com. Again, that's www.aifrenzyreport.com for a free copy of his new report. Jason, welcome to the show. It's good of you to be here with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Jason, you are, I look through our archives, I've been doing this for years, and you're not in there. So, I'm really happy to uh, have you on for the first time. And since you are a new guest, um, let's start this way. If, if you and I met in a bar and got into a discussion, I'm not saying either one of us hangs around in bars, but if we got into a discussion and, and found out what each other does and I said, Hey, what kind of investor are you? What would your answer be? Um, I'm a, I'm a trader, sort of a mid midterm kind of trader. I try to, um, produce return streams that have obviously hopefully positive returns and negative correlation to uh, most other return streams so that when my investors are, are putting together a portfolio um, and trying to push out their returns relative to the risk, you know, the idea is by adding zero and negative correlated return streams with positive return expectations, um, they can do that. So that, that's what I offer to people. 
That sounds like it would have been really, really super valuable in 2022, especially. I, I think, you know, over time, it, it adds value. If, if, uh, mm -hmm. if I can do what I am trying to do, which to this point I have been able to do, um, yeah, over time, it, it adds value, hopefully. That's the idea anyway. You know? um, I, I should tell our listeners that uh, Jason is a, uh, how does one say, a market wizard. <laughs> That's a, it's a, uh, it's probably a title. Most of the market wizards don't like to be called wizards. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of a joke. It's a but, little um, embarrassing, but you know, <laughs> right? Uh, meaning that he was interviewed by Jack Schweiger and included in one of Jack Schweiger's books. We've had Jack on the program and a few other wizards. Unknown market wizard, though, right? Unknown, at least. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's that's right. Jason's an unknown. There's a there's a different title to every market wizard book. So Jason's one of the unknown market wizards. Hopefully, he's more known after this. Um, how long ago did you do that? It was a few Jack? years. It was a few years ago. I want to say it was maybe three years ago. And let's let's go back a little bit here. How long have you been doing this? I can see uh, through the video here that you have a couple of gray hairs. Yeah. Um, I'm 56. Uh, I think I placed my first trade and started doing this when I was 22. What What made you start doing this? Did you major in finance or anything in school? I did. Not that that had anything to do with it, but uh, okay, <laughs> right. But I, I don't know. I was um, my first sort of real job, so to speak, uh, was in Hong Kong, and I worked for a uh, a commercial bank, and I was um, in like their little executive development program, and uh, I was not supposed to be there. Um, it wasn't really for me. And I think that they would agree with that just as much as I say it. Um, <laughs> and I think like most people that get involved in this, you know, um, there was a bull market going on around me, you know, and I was like, Hey, uh, let's, let's see what this is all about, you know? Um, mm. and so I got involved, uh, and went through, I would say what, what most people went through you know, and go through when they get into this, get involved when there's a bull market going on, um, make money during the bull market, not realize when the bull market ends, lose money when the bull market ends. And then from there, try to figure out, um, what you want to do, you know? And, and I, at that point I had sort of gotten hooked on the whole thing. Um, I had read the first market wizards book, which had a, a big effect on me. That was actually when that book was in the bookstores. Um, which had a big effect on me. I, I liked the whole idea of what people were talking about in there. Um, it struck a chord with me. And so I kind of wanted to dedicate myself to, uh, to doing this. And that's what I did. And, uh, you know, it just got to a point where I was at a certain point, I had no other choice because I had been doing it for so long. And, uh, you know, I had to kind of try to figure out how to make it work. You know, I remember reading um, those first two Market Wizards books and thinking, to me, it was interesting because they all had different stories. But in the end, there were just a few things that all sounded the same. And we always wind up here when we talk with traders. And you're nodding your head and I'm saying, yeah, it's like position sizing, um, you know, cut your losses, let your winners run, all that kind of stuff. And I think maybe in all the books, there's like one or two guys who you don't, who that's not the main thing that you hear from them. And, and I know they're not doing this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. They're, they're not doing it anymore. So when I look at those books, I think, you know, it's, they're great interviews and I could see how somebody would be inspired by them. But, you know, I thought, gosh, that sounds really boring. Um, what sounds exciting? What sounded exciting about it to you? What was exciting about it? The idea that if you could be successful at this, um, and this was false hopes as it turned out for the most part, but then you didn't have to really, you know, live the nine to five kind of grind. Right. Um, the idea that, uh, it didn't matter what people's opinions were. And in fact, it was beneficial to be against what most people's opinions were. Um, you know, I always say, like, if I go to a party and everybody's talking about some movie and how great it is and and I'm the only one in there saying that actually the movie stunk and th then I lose because I can't win that argument. You know, majority, you know, they kick me out of the party. You're an idiot. We all agree. You don't. You're an idiot. Get out of here. Right. And I can't prove otherwise. Whereas in the market, it doesn't make a difference. Right. Um, if everybody is bullish 
and I'm bearish, we can sit here and argue about it. But at the end of the day, um, we get the answer. You know, um, there's no arguing about it, right? You can be bullish, bullish, bullish. I could be bearish. Well, if the market goes down, then, hey, you can sit here and tell me why, you know, you were still right. But at the end of the day, P&L speaks, right? So that whole thing, being the type of person that I was, I wasn't really very good at getting along with uh, groups of people and, and, and getting along with bosses and, and that type of thing. Um, given that that's how I was, it, it seemed appealing to me. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people are like that. They just kind of suck it up because they don't know what to do about it. You found something to do about it. So you would call yourself a natural contrarian then, of course, just naturally part of your personality. And that fits in with your trading style, um, which if you could describe that, it sounds like you 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 like to you like to go against the grain. But I guess that's in contrast, especially to a lot of market wizards who talk about wanting to ride the trend. So while everyone else who sort of does what you do i know that's just a very in, in a very general way is looking to ride the trend you're looking to what fade it and figure out when it's going to end um that that sounds very different to me i, I, re, I know the position sizing and the cutting losses and all that are the same but you you must have a very different process than what other folks describe the other folks describe breakouts and all the you know all the usual stuff that that we associate with that type of trading well, that can't be what you're doing, can it? No. No, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. So without giving away your secret sauce. No, you know, no, you could... I don't care. I am trying to pick turns in the market. Um, I think I do it a little bit differently than most do, which is something I learned after doing it the wrong way for a long time. I don't disagree with don't fight the trend. Um, I don't base picking turns on price you know a lot of people think that they're being contrarian by thinking hey this thing has gone up a lot therefore i'm going to short it you know um and that's not how i do it that that will get you run over um over time pretty badly um i look at it more from a participation perspective so i'm trying to measure the participation so it's not this has gone up a lot therefore i'm going to short it it's more like everybody in the world is long this thing therefore i'm going to short it and I think that's what puts risk reward, hopefully, over time in my favor. So I think that I think that the discounting mechanism in the market. This is where I disagree with with most uh, things. I think the discounting mechanism in the market is not price; it's participation. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Can you yeah, talk what, more what, about that? What, that yeah, is very. What kind of reports are you looking at to determine that? And uh, how, how do you determine that? Yeah. So it's a combination. The main. The main data source that I use is the Commitments of Traders report in the futures market, which shows where people are positioned. And I'm looking for, you know, mass um, one-way sided based on history sort of positioning and that type of stuff to start thinking about um, going the other way. Um, and then the other things I do are more discretionary feels for it in terms of listening to people, reading a lot of things, and, and trying to determine where the positioning is you know um and after doing that for 30 some odd years i like to at least believe that i'm decent at that sometimes you know um i think one of the perfect examples this last 12 months has been this nvidia thing you know everybody wants to say nvidia is up too much it's up too much you got to short it you got to short it you got to short it and to me when i hear everybody saying that then that's telling me that it's not time to short it you know, so I have been able, I don't trade equities anyway, but I have been able to avoid um, even hinting at NVIDIA being, being a short. Okay. You mostly trade futures? I trade all futures. All futures. Okay. And just all markets or do you focus on particular markets? All the U.S. markets, because that's where I can get the commitments of traders data um, that have liquidity. So there's like 37 markets, you know, I, I kind of look at it like uh, I'm counting cards on 37 different tables. And when the <laughs> when the count is good at one of the tables, that's where I go and play. You know, it's one process across as many markets as I can do it. Okay, that doesn't sound like nine to five. That sounds like nine a.m. to nine a.m. <laughs> it sounds like I think that, that you like... are a hundred percent. That's that's correct. There, there were many things in my original assessment that were that were off, and that was one of them. It's it's certainly not nine to five. It's not. It's never ends, including weekends. So. Yeah. 
Okay, so but you're still doing it. You obviously it's you found yourself. You you love it, right? I enjoy what I do. I think it's a uh, you know it, it's a fun puzzle to try and, and figure out. Um, at least on the winning days, it's a fun puzzle. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but you know it, it, I I accept it for what it is. I've taken a lot of the so called excitement out of it. Um, as I become more of a professional trader, I, I try not to do this for excitement. It, it's uh, and people, another thing that I missed, you know, it was very exciting when I was young and also in the end, not profitable. Now it's much <laughs> less exciting, you know, because it's, it's a job, you know, I have a job to do, you know? Yep. Um, and, and it's a very, very difficult job. Very. Yes. Yeah. There it is. It, it is what it is. I, I'm here. There's nothing I can do now. The law schools won't accept me now. So, um, <laughs> So how do you deal? I get to hear it a little bit in your voice, you know, like if you have a down day or a bad, a, a bad trade or whatever. Um, how do you get back at it? Is it just the process that you you've trusted over thirty years, and you know they're going to happen? And because I think a lot of individual investors, maybe they're just starting out, right? Can like, oh no, I'm I've got in at the completely wrong time on Bitcoin. Like, I, why is why am I not making any money on on Bitcoin when it seems everybody is like. Right. What's the lesson there? Like you, you got to have a. I think the lesson is process, you know, um, which people don't really get a lot. But it's all about process to me, you know, Be, for so many reasons. Right. But just to this point, how do I deal with it? Well, because I just follow my process and my process to this point has done what I want it to do. Um, and I monitor that clearly all the time. And I am comfortable with the fact that within my process there are losing trades right um in fact i have more losing trades over time than i have winning trades okay so i'm comfortable with that because i can go back 23 years now i've been running this same process right um and i can go back over 23 years and, and look at my returns and, and 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 my win to losses and all that stuff and i can believe that it has worked this far now i'm always ready for it to stop working <laughs> um and if it does hopefully i will be monitoring that um and realize it um but to this point it, it's been fine so this is what i do and you know at, at this point in my life quite frankly if it should stop working well then you know i don't know retirement calls i guess you know uh, <laughs> yeah so that's what I do. I do what I do. It provides the return streams that I needed to provide. That's the return streams that my clients want from me. Um, and, and therefore that, that's, that's what I do. It's just a job and I'm just following a process. You know, if I were a trend follower, um, I don't think that I would be managing any money. Quite frankly, here, here I'm sitting in my house as a one man operation. What institution would want to give me money? Right. I have nobody working for me. I'm a one-man operation. I don't have the big back office stuff. I don't have a huge research team, right? So why would you give me money as a trend follower when you could pick a, a hundred trend following firms that have billions of dollars under management, you know? Um, people give me money because I do a very specific thing. It's very hard to find zero to negatively non-correlated return streams to put in your portfolio that 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 make money over time. So... Therefore, that's why clients give me money, and that's why it's pretty easy for me to just stick to my process and do what it is I want to do, you know, and do what it is I, I do. Um, I have people that want to, like, copy trade me, and, and I, I tell them that they shouldn't do that because their goals are probably different than my goals, you know. I, I want to make positive returns. I want to make very good risk adjusted returns. Okay. Just like everybody. I don't get paid if I don't do that. I'm not on two and 20. I'm on zero and 30. Okay. So I don't get paid anything if I don't make money. So yes, I want to make money. Clearly having negative correlation and negative returns is worthless. Okay. Not only to me, but to my clients. Um, so yes, I want to do that. But within that is the huge constraint that I want to do it in a negatively correlated way. So that is not necessarily, you know, in people's what, what they're trying to do when they're trying to trade the market. They're just trying to, hey, make as much money as they can, right? 
And I get that, but you have a different set of goals. Yeah. yeah. Copy trading me is, you know, it's just a different set of goals. So you have to know what your goal is going in and therefore, you know, take it from there. Um, I think so. Anyway, Jason, you sound all of a piece. Your natural contrarian instinct led you to trade a certain way and trading that certain way, as you pointed out, is quite different from what any number of uh, trend following firms uh, do. That's that's interesting to me. You've re- you found yourself, and I tell you something. We have a lot of listeners and a lot of readers who who think they're going to do <laughs> something, you know, like what the traders we speak with, yourself included, do. And I very I gently, maybe I should be less gentle. I gently kind of maybe not discourage them, but try to point out that it is a you know, 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. job if you're really good at it. It's not a lottery ticket. Jason doesn't, you know, most of his trades, do, you know, more don't work than do work. There's there's so much more to it than than what our listeners uh, believe. You people sound like ask me the all the time, you know, people tell me all the time, I, I want to quit my job and be a full-time trader. I, I want to be a <laughs> trader. You know, what, what, what should I do? And I say, here's what you should do. Go to law school. Okay, that's what you should do. Get, get paid by the hour, right? A, a good amount of money for the work that you do. Save it, and then trade on the side. You know, and if you have five good years in a row of trading on the side, then think about maybe doing that, right? But um, it, there's a reason why you know things are pretty efficient in economics. You know, there's a reason why the best hedge fund managers get paid billions of dollars a year. And that's because it's so extremely hard to do, you know? So that's why they are able to earn that. It's just like an NBA player. It's very hard to be able to play basketball at an NBA level. So therefore, if you can do that, yeah, you make $30, $40 million, right? Um, it's the same thing, you know? You, you have to understand it's it's very, very, very difficult, you know? It really is. Yeah. Talk, to, talk to any of these these people. And even if you look at, the returns of various hedge fund groups, um, you know, o- over time, right? I mean, Tiger Management or whatever, they, they crushed it while the market was going up and they owned all the highest beta stuff. And then when the highest beta stuff came down, they, they got crushed, right? They didn't have any magic formula going on here. They just bet on, on, on a bull market in a very levered way and and it happened, right? <laughs> you know? um, there's a lot of... Um, survivorship bias involved there that, that people, you know, don't want to understand, you know, they want to think there's some genius behind this. I don't really think that there is. Um, it's just a question of, of risk reward. And so many of the personality traits that it takes to really, I believe, be successful at this over time are the antithesis of what human nature is, right? So, you have to be able to put away everything that you have been taught to believe, you know, mm. your ego, you know, your defense mechanisms, you know, um, all your behavioral biases that you have not only come to develop over the course of your life, but were probably developed via human DNA way before you were ever born. Right. All of these things have to be um, overcome because they don't work, you know, right. and it's, a, it's just an extremely difficult thing to do. It's also an extremely lonely place to be. I can tell you. Okay. Um, it's not going to make you friends, right? It's not going to make you popular. You know, you have to think about what you want in, in life. Most people in life want to be liked, want to be loved, right? These are basic human needs, you know, and this won't get you that, Right. So you really have to think about if that's what you're, what you're after. Be careful what you wish for, as they say. I like to say that successful trading is an unnatural act. It is. It's like jumping, jumping out of an airplane with or without a parachute is an unnatural act. Which I, I could never do. I, I could never do that. My body doesn't let me do that. I, I tried to do that thing where you jump off the bridge one time with the bungee. Oh, the bungee, yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't do it. My body was just like, no, this does not make sense. So... I'm not doing it. <laughs> Risk averse. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think I might be with you on that. I haven't tried it. I've thought I could do it. My wife actually did uh, zip lining, and she said it was a, it gave her PTSD. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> and and I have video of her screaming the whole way. <laughs> she there were like seven lines and seven screams. It's just horrible. Uh, you said something interesting. You were talking about um, other people imitating you. They, you know, saying they wanted to tr- to imitate your trades, and you told them that was a bad idea. But it makes me wonder, and I was wondering this before. You're a one man operation. I wonder how much of what you're doing is or can be automated. In your opinion, I mean, well, the is would not be an opinion, but could be. Parts of it are are, are quite automated. I once ran this thing 100% automated and found that it worked, but it didn't work as well. So uh, I, stopped, I stopped doing that. Um, they say, what somebody said to me once was, computers can do a better job than humans, but a human and a computer can do a better job than a computer. So that's what mine is. It's a combination. Like I won't take any trades that my automated system doesn't say take, Okay. Um, but I sometimes will not take a trade that my automated system says take, but that comes from a few things. It comes from having run it automated for a while, knowing where some of those weaknesses were, because I was able to observe where the weaknesses in the automated thing were over time. Right. So I, I like to believe at least that I can avoid that sometimes, not all the time, but even if I can just a few, avoid a few of the bad trades that the system would have taken that I don't take. And of course, it comes with the risk of not taking a trade that the system takes that does work, right? So which one is it? And you, over time, I have, and I monitor this, you know, the system versus me. And if I weren't beating the system, then um, then I would just trade the system, right? Um now, you, you can argue, hey, you're saying less than 50% of your trades are profitable. Okay. So that means if I don't take one of the system trades, then I got more than a 50% chance of, of, of getting that right. You know what I mean? Maybe it's just as simple as that. I, I, I don't know. But um, I have been beating the system since I went back to doing the combination of system about six years ago. I, I've, I've beaten the system pretty handily. So that's what I keep doing. You know, this is all about, like I say, you got to take your ego out of this stuff, right? it's all about numbers. It's all about statistics, you know, and you've got to monitor these statistics so that you can know, you know, you think you have an edge because you, you did some trade and it worked. Okay. But it's not a question. Do a thousand trades and see if it works. Right. That That's what matters. Right. Any one trade can work at any time. You know what I mean? Uh, and you can go on a hot streak too. And, and any five trades can work at any time. But the question is, does it work over time? And unfortunately it only takes time. You know, this is what, Backtesting can help you do, has its flaws, but it can at least help you go back and see if what you're doing maybe has worked over time and, and save you 10 years of trying to figure that out for yourself. But So if you can, yeah. what, uh, can you share an example of what, you know, maybe something that you're looking for, like what's a consensus thought out in the market right now and how you trade against, you know, like just what, what things you type, kind of consider against that if there's one you know you mentioned the video you don't trade you know equities but you know something along those lines like what like what what what, what, what are you looking at right now so i have zero trades right. on right now um what, what i'm looking at because what i find to be the most crowded thing right now is short grains so i'm looking to get long grains um at a certain point i need the market to confirm my trade before i ever do it like i'm not going to say oh everyone is short grains here so i'm going to buy them it has to be something more like everybody is short grains here and they're no longer going down on bad news. So I'm going to buy them. Right. Um, and I would encourage anybody to do that. Um, no matter how they trade market confirmation first. Okay. You might think the video is overvalued and you might be a hundred percent right. Okay. But wait for the market to confirm it first. However you want to define confirmation, I, I define it based on that sort of news failure event, as we call it. But define it how you want. It goes through the 21-day moving average as a confirmation. Okay, good. Then wait for it to go through its 21-day moving average before you short it, right? Or h- however you want to define it, you know, is fine. But let the market confirm what you're, what you're thinking first because you're not smarter than the market. I promise you, right? 
And if you think you are, that's you, you, you're just going to get erased. Mark, it doesn't care what, what you think, right? Yeah, yeah I, I want to point out for li- our listeners that um, what Jason just said about the market confirming, um, thats he's not the first guest to do that. Uh, lots of successful folks have pointed out, you know, the, the, a typical thing, we'll get into a discussion about short selling with a few people and they'll say, you know, I don't short the thing until it starts go, you know, until it curls over, till the chart curls over is a phrase I've heard by s- some folks. And it's, uh, you know, like, like you said, however you establish that confirmation, you got to wait for it. You can't walk in front of an oncoming train. I mean, I've been telling people recently, like y- y- you think the stock market's going to crash. Okay, fine. If you're right, then will missing the first 20 points in the S&P make a difference? If your thesis is going to crash, then why do you have to sell the new high every single day? You know, you miss it. It's going to crash. A crash, I mean, the S&P is what? Close to 5,000 here? 49 and change? Okay. 49.25 on the S&P 500. So if it's going to crash, it's going to 2,000. So if you sell it at 48.75 instead of 49.25, like, like is that going to make a difference? And if you had been waiting for that, you would have not been shorting yet. You know what I mean? So, and it would have mm-hmm. saved you thousands, you know, hundreds and hundreds of points. So it, it's such an important concept that market confirmation, how you want to define it, it, it to me is such an important concept. Um, and, you know, all of these concepts, I, I clearly didn't make, like you say, everyone that comes on here says this, right? I didn't make any of these concepts up, right? Ride your winners, no. cut your losses, wait for market confirmation. You know, I mean, I didn't make any of this stuff up. And yet everybody, almost everybody who has had success over time trading says them all. Maybe that means something. You know what I mean? Every rule that I go by comes right out of those first two market wizards books. I can tell you that, right? Um, and why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't I learn from Paul Tudor Jones, Bruce Kovner, Michael Marcus, you, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make mm-hmm. sense not to. Like, wouldn't you rather learn how to play basketball from, you know, Michael Jordan, LeBron James or whatever um, right. than, 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 than somebody not them, right? Um, right. You know, if, if Michael Jordan tells me that I should, you know, drive to the basket like this, maybe I should, maybe I should listen to that. You know, call me crazy, <laughs> but you know, um, so it, it, like why relearn those lessons? You're going to relearn them. Okay. If that's what you choose to do. I did. Okay. <laughs> I had to, but why not learn them early? It's very hard for people to learn without learning the hard way by themselves. I, I get that. And I was guilty of that as well, but my best advice is go read those books and, um, and, and let those lessons really sink in because they're they're just fact. You're not being lied to. Bruce Kovner's not lying to you. Paul Tudor Jones isn't lying to you. And I'm not lying to you. These are like the rules of the game. So pl- learn the rules of the game first. And even once you have the rules, it's still freaking hard as hell. Okay? But at least get the rules of the game first. Cut your losses quickly. That should be rule one. Cut your losses quickly. Right? Let your winners ride. Wait for the market to confirm. Don't think you're smarter than the market. There's the rule book. Now go out. You know, it's like I say, Michael Jordan can teach me how to drive to the basket a million freaking times. I'm still never going to be able to drive to the basket like him because I don't have the physical attributes that he has. All right. Um, right. But still, those are the rules of the game. So uh, believe them is, is what I could say. That's actually really well said. Um <laughs> Thank you for that. Did you ever work for any of those guys you mentioned? My big break in this business was when I met Helmut Weimer, who was the guy who started Commodities Corporation. And he introduced me to Bruce Kovner. And I interviewed there and uh, I got shut down, not by Bruce, but by a few of the other people because my personality, I guess, was a bit too uh, whatever. Um, But I did meet (laughs) Bruce Kovner once. Um, I met Paul Tudor Jones once um, at a conference. I'll tell you something. That Paul, the biggest effect Paul Tudor Jones had on me was I met him at a conference. I was in my 20s. I was just starting off and I was kind of trying to raise money. And I went to one of these conferences and he spoke. And me being the cocky me at 26 that I was, I went over to him and shook his hand. And I said, hey, nice to meet you. I said, I'm coming after you. And he looked at me and he said, 
just make sure you give back when you get there. That's all he oh, said. Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah, so Paul's a well-known we philanthropist. Uh, right, so we, we, which had a very big effect on me. He didn't say, oh, good luck, sucker, I'm the best, you know, whatever. He, you know, there was nothing like that. You know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. all he said. Make sure you give back when you get there. And did you? Yes, I mean, I, I yes, yes. I wouldn't say okay. did I. I am now getting to that you point are. in my life where I am, okay. I am trying to do a lot of that, yes. Okay, well. Not just in, yeah, you know, monetary, not just in monetary terms, <laughs> sure. you know what I mean? Like I do have some charities that I support, but also like in this type of stuff, I'm trying to get the word out to people, you know, of, yeah. you know, what you're doing and what you're being presented on financial news, okay, is wrong, right? So stop and start to think about the right way to approach this. I think that's a big part of what I'm trying to do in terms of this, this part of my life, giving back. And, and that all kind of started with my, um, when I was in that Market Wizards book, because a lot of people after that started to approach me and were asking me, hey, can you help me? Can you mentor me? Can you teach me? Can you this? Can you that? Can you everything? And so that's what I'm trying to do. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're doing it, man, because what, it sounds to me like you just said to the whole world the reason for this podcast right? We don't want to be, you know, whatever, take your pick, the CNBC or, you know, uh, Fox Business or whatever, you know, Bloomberg News. We we want to be the people who interview Jason Shapiro and have him oh. saying, eh, well. Mm. Yeah, you don't want to be them. Yeah, that's right. We don't want to be them. All right. Um, listen, hey, I don't normally do this, but like Corey, we don't normally have Jason Shapiro on the show. So I think we need to take advantage of it. Do you have any anything before we, we let Jason go? No, just thank you. I mean, thanks for what you're doing. You're uh, spreading the 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 rule book. Uh, you know, like you said, I think a lot of people <laughs> would be thankful to to listen to what you're saying. And because so many, there's a lot of younger generation of people that would just you know want to get into trading or whatever, and and they're just not <laughs> doing it. Uh, have any idea of of what it takes and uh, what you're saying? So, so just thanks for yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, I got into trading when I was a young person. It was a bull market. I got involved. I made a bunch of money more than I should have because I was young. I was stupid. I was leveraged. I made a bunch of money. The bull market ended. I gave it all back. By the time the the bear market, then I learned, hey, you can actually make money short. So let's do that. So I started trying to go short. Made some money. Lost it all because then the, I didn't know when the market was going to bottom and start going up again. So I lost it all. I, and that's what you're doing, okay? I know whoever you are out there, I know that's what happened to you, okay? <laughs> the reason I know is because it's what happened to me and it's what happened to everybody that I know, okay? So just know, you know different. Um, the, learn, the, the quicker you get to that point, I think the, the better. And so you really need to start finding what edge means. You really need to figure out how to get process going that, that takes advantage of that edge. And, and you really need to have the discipline to stick to that process to take advantage of that edge so that you can earn positive returns over time. I always say it process discipline, you know, that that's, that's what this game is about, right? Predicting future. No, not going to work. And with you with All cutting right. losses, I mean, I'm sure you have specific rules that you've determined over time, right? Like this is when I'm losing money on this trade, right? Like predetermined. And you're not wavering from that, right? No, nope. no. But I mean, you, ha you know, for me, okay, I'm picking a market turn, right? That's what I do. Well, if I'm buying something because I think it's a market turn, and if it makes a new low, well, then by definition, I didn't get the market turn, so I, I stop out. But you can do that with anything. If you're buying a breakout, okay, I bought a breakout. Well, if it breaks back down below that, well, then it's not a breakout anymore. Get out, you know. And okay, you get out, and then it goes back up, and you're like, oh shit, I should have held it. Whatever that happens too, right? But you have to have that that definition in. Why am I buying this stuff? Where is it wrong? Right? I'm buying it based on this. Where is that wrong? Because that's where I got to stop my stop out. It's not that hard of a concept. Um, like I say, these are the rules. But obviously, following the rules then be, because no one forces you to do it. Right? Oh, I won't stop out here. I'll give it a day to breathe. You know, and then you give it a day to breathe, and then you know whatever the news comes out and the thing drops twenty percent in your face and. Now you can't afford to take the loss. I'll wait for the bounce. And then it doesn't bounce. It goes down another 20%, you know, and then you're forced out. And now you have no money left to catch one that maybe would have worked, right? You, you have to stay alive. I always tell people you got to stay alive long enough to get lucky. Awesome. And, and that's, what, that's what taking losses is all about. Take them quick. Yeah, managing your luck. All right, so we're, yeah. we're actually at our um, – it's time for our final question. 
And it's the identical question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's a non-financial topic. And that question is simply, if you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? And if you've already said it, by all means, repeat it. You're not going to make money over time in the markets by being smarter than, than the market. OK, you, you, you're just not. Um, look, if you're an investor, it's, it's a different thing, right? If you're a long term, own the stock market investor, good for you, right? That's a great thing. If you're trying to be a trader and trade the markets long and short and this and that, um, you, you got to know that um, the, the answer is not you're going to make money because you're better at predicting the future than other people because you're not. Nobody is, right? You're going to make money because you're better than other people at cutting losses and letting winners ride. That's where you're going to make money. That's it. I've said it to people before. Then when they call me a market wizard, I said, if I'm a market wizard, okay, <laughs> then the, the, the reason is, is because I cut losses very, very well. I'm a market wizard because I'm really good at losing money. That, that, that's it, man. That's it. The, the rest is, is, is just there to fool you, man. It, it, it's going to fool you and it's going to hurt you over time. Yeah, wizardry is humility in that respect, right? Listen, man, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And thanks for uh, being of a mind to want to get the word out and using us to do it. Great. All right, Jason, have a, have a great day. And uh, I hope we'll be able to talk to you again in, uh, I don't know, 12 months or so and just see what you're up to. Anytime, man. Anytime. Just hit me up. It's great talking to you guys. Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Okay, we will do. The Fed wants you to believe they've got inflation under control, but I believe we've only seen the beginning of a devastating new crisis. And if you don't prepare now, you could see your savings evaporate as inflation and interest rates soar even higher over the next two years. It all traces back to a golden thread that ties together the biggest financial calamities in America's history. But it seems the entire financial world is falling into this very same denial trap that led to massive devastation the last time this crisis played out. If you know your history, you know there will be winners and losers, and now is when you decide which one you'll be. I've spelled it all out in an urgent new report. Go to www.fm bankrun2023.com to get your free copy. I'll also show you how to get my complete playbook for navigating this crisis, including the three critical steps to take immediately. Again, that's www.bankrun2023.com for your free copy of my new report. Well, it's really a lot of fun to have a, yet another market wizard on the show. Um, and I'm glad it was Jason because he's sort of, um, most of them are trend followers and he's a contrarian, right? He's looking for the big turns. And it was good to hear about his process and the commitments of traders report. And then that sounds like the beginning of his process. Commitments of traders, you'll see, you know, people tweeting and doing reports and things and saying, well, commitments of traders says something, so I'm going to go the other way. And that's not the end for him. That's the beginning. I found that pretty, pretty interesting too. And, and it's also interesting that he tried to automate the thing and, and there's just, it, it works better when he uses his discretion in addition to the system. Um, and, it, and I just, I found all that fascinating. I, I, I find these market wizards absolutely fascinating. They don't get into the market wizards books without having a really, really excellent long-term track record. Um, so I, I just I love these guys, and I and Jason in particular is is a fascinating guy. Yeah, that was great. I mean, it's great to to talk to a, a real pro trader like that. In, in case mm -hmm. nobody got the sense of that, that is who he is. And yeah, you could check out his stuff, Crowded Market Report, which he started relatively recently. This is uh, mm -hmm. one of his publications, and yeah, I mean, it's just great that you know you hear from a guy with a track record like he has. And you can look that up too, like explain to you like there's no secrets here it's it's uh it's what you know everybody it's what all the people in those books have said it's what he's saying you just have to like stick to it and you know everybody's human and you gotta have a process and a plan if you're getting into trading and understand that we're talking about trading here we're not talking about like long-term investing either and 
and that sort of thing and picking stocks for for 10 or 20 years like this is totally different than that but if you want to trade you gotta have a process to do it and that, that might be the best one of the best lines i've ever heard he's great at losing money is his secret <laughs> like that's yeah that's yeah. that's something when you get into this it's like totally counterintuitive but it's so the truth yeah I, i've actually i've heard something like that before from other traders you know mostly what i do is lose money right because and it's not unusual we should let everyone know it's not unusual for really great um successful very wealthy um traders to lose money on more trades than they make money on um i, I read somewhere recently where it said george soros made money on 30 percent of his trades uh, and he said his big his big thing in life was knowing when he was wrong and fixing his mistakes, which to me sounds like going long, having the market go against you and turning around and going short, that kind of thing, which is really, really highly unusual. <laughs> in fact, most people are unable to successfully short their longs that go against them and vice versa, right? Yeah. If you have the stomach and the timeline to accept small losses along the way, uh, then you can last, right? Because those are going to happen. Yeah. I'm talking about that particular thing, though, because, you know, Jason's catching big turns, which is a little bit different from what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is like people have either like the experience or just the, the mental process and the psyche or whatever you want to say, the mindset to be long. Very few people can handle being short at all. And the idea of, you know, go, shorting one of your longs or longing one of your shorts, it just sort of cuts against what is reasonable to expect out of any human being. But, and then there's another thing entirely, which is what Jason does, which is getting these market turns right. And I'm glad he, like, I, I felt his most important point was, um, yeah, I wait for the market to confirm it, by the way. <laughs> you know, it's it's not, you know, he's you're not stepping in front of the oncoming train because you're pretty sure he's going to hit the brakes. No, you're, he's already hit the brakes, uh, you know, by whatever, you know, indicator you might use to establish that uh, in the market. But, but I think that's important. I was thinking of um, uh, our old friend Jeff Clark from, gosh, forever ago. And, and he said something that I said during the interview that I'll never forget. He said, I would, when, when I go short, I wait till the chart curls over. Um, obviously, Jeff's more interested in price than, you know, commitments to traders, but same idea. Yeah, no, it, yeah, it was, it's a great point. And, and the fact that he has, you can tell he's got set goals for returns for himself, his clients using his particular strategy and so once you have that a goal and you have this the, the strategy of or the, the, you know the way that you can achieve that goal I, it becomes a lot easier to stick to cutting losses and um stick to a, a process when you believe that you and you've done it over time that it works and that was another important part i picked up from him was you know i think generally i know i'm pretty bad at looking back at if something actually worked or if admitting that it didn't and keeping track of that over a long period of time. I, I think that once you do that, it kind of helps you see if, if something's working or not. I mean, you can just, this is not yeah. a gut. This is not a, a game you want to be just playing off a gut. Right. So what you're, yeah, I noticed that too. Um, when he was talking, like he, uh, he must use the phrase and I keep track of that. And I, and I track that and I, you know, measure that. And, you know, it's, you're holding yourself. The point about humility is just, it cuts across the entire enterprise of trading because you're holding yourself against all of these, you know, the market itself, you know, when it comes to a given trade being confirmed, whether or not your process works over time based on your results, confirming that, et cetera, et cetera. You know, his discussion about the automated system versus automated system plus his discretion, you know, which and he confirmed that the discretion was better than just the system by itself. You constantly are having, it's a scientific endeavor, right? You're, you're making hypotheses and the market is either proving them correct or incorrect. And when you prove them incorrect, you got to change them, which well, is a really important point. It's that's, you know, you got to get your, like you said, get your ego out of the equation and have all these things in place and 
and treat it like a real, like a business and a, like I said, a scientific endeavor. It's hard, man. It's really hard. It's a 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. job. Yeah, it's his job. You know, he said it. It's a job. But I think anybody even dabbling in trading can hopefully learn something from that. Yeah. I mean, just the idea of the market confirming or disconfirming. Like, as he was speaking, I have one particular stock in mind um, in, in the Ferris report. And I'm having to sit here and think. I do have, you know, I use trailing stops and things. And the stop hasn't been hit yet. But there's... If it's a short fund and the market's making a new high, hmm, maybe I don't need to wait until the <laughs> stop is hit, right? So um, that's something I need to wrestle with. I need to, I need to say, you know, is the market disconfirming me when my stop is hit or does it disconfirm a short fund when the market makes a new high? And I'm, I'm not sure which way I'm going to go. I need to decide because the newsletter's coming out. <laughs> It'll be out by the time you hear these words. <laughs> so... Uh, but yeah, I just thought, uh, wow, yeah, yeah, you should, you should, in other words, like that's the idea I want to leverage into. I already have the automated, you know, relatively set process in place, but you know, most folks want to leverage into their ability to predict the future and say, oh, I'm going to double down. This thing's down 10%, but yay, I'm going to double down or down 20 or 30 or 50 or whatever it is. Oh, but I'm going to buy more because I just know it. Um, that's not what you leverage into. You leverage into the market confirming or disconfirming whether or not you're right. And if the market, you know, has really truly disconfirmed or confirmed, you got to admit it. You got to say, Hmm, yeah, that's the real disconfirmation or confirmation. Um, that's the, that's the way to think about this stuff. Not, I'm sure it's all going to work out in the end. (laughs) That's not a, that's hope. That's not a strategy. Yeah. Then you will, it will not all work out in the end if that is the way you're going. (laughs) All right. Um, Man, that was so cool. I love talking to market wizards uh, in in general. And, and we've had some, like we had Chris Camillo on here. Very interesting guy. Totally different way of looking at the market. Now Jason Shapiro, you know, different way of looking at um at the market uh he's going he's looking to go the other way very bold um so that was really super enjoyable for me i know Corey loved it too um that's another interview and that's another episode of the stansbury investor hour i hope you enjoyed it as much as we did we do provide a transcript for every episode just go to www.investorhour.com click on the episode you want scroll all the way down click on the word transcript and enjoy If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com, please. And also, do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at investorhour.com or call our listener feedback line 800 381 2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co host, Corey McLaughlin, until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. 
Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.